Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. If you're like me, you probably too cheap to buy extra copies of the books that you really love, but too much in love with the books that you really love to not be willing to share them with others. And it's for that reason that I don't have a copy of the book that I want to talk about today in this curating your book library segment because somewhere along the line I must have lent it out to someone and I didn't have a spare copy. But It's one of those books that just, I don't know how to describe it, it just crushes the it's really pleasant to read scale and is prodigious in its really helpful scale. And the book is called Angels in the Architecture. Not that, That's my kind of a title because it doesn't really tell you that much uh, about what the book is about unless you are more attuned to uh, what that kind of language means than, than I am. Uh, One way to describe the book is uh, to see it as a defense of Christendom. That what this book is, is an exploration of what a Christian culture should look like. And it takes a great deal of its uh, exposition of what that culture should look like uh, from looking at the Middle Ages, what the broader world calls the Dark Ages, and there are reasons for that, but generally speaking, their distaste for that age is because of the uh, influence and power and supremacy of uh, a Christian worldview at the time. And so we would call it, in many ways, a great and glorious time. Yes, again, there are weaknesses, but this particular book manages to artfully and beautifully uh, sort of take us back and forth between what the Bible has to say about culture, what we saw in the Middle Ages, how the hardships and ugliness in our own culture reflect a turning of the back against that ancient wisdom, all tied together with uh, just outstanding writing. The authors of this book, because it has two authors, are uh, Douglas Wilson, uh, sometimes referred to as he who shall not be named uh, by certain people who uh, get in a tizzy and get uh, uh, all bent out of shape over anything positive said about him. Uh, And the other author being Doug Jones, who ironically could uh, get people in a tizzy who actually like Doug Wilson, because uh, while I understand everything was very good and strong personally, uh, since the publication of this book, there's been some kind of uh, ideological divide between these two Dougs. Well... Uh, I happen to know both of these Dugs and happen to enjoy both of these Dugs and especially enjoy this book. Angels in the Architecture was originally published by Canon Press and I believe is still available uh, from them, though I'm not 100% certain. but again, I commend it to you, not just because it's a fun read. It's, it's brief, and it's breezy, and it's uh, conversational. 
but it really does help you sort of learn not just about the Middle Ages or not. It, it helps you learn. Uh, I think I put it this way: the process by which religion externalized becomes a culture. It's like watching Henry Van Til uh, reach his conclusion in real time, if that makes any sense. It was Henry Van Til who said, by the way, that, re that culture is religion externalized. And one of the things I like about that is it can be profoundly helpful uh, for reverse engineering our walk. That is, when you look and see how the ways the broader culture has influenced your thinking or my thinking, then we can begin to think, oh, now, wait a minute. This, is, this doesn't sound like uh, this should grow out of our Christian faith. Let's take a look at the Middle Ages. Let's compare and contrast. Another way of putting it is uh, it's almost like uh, – Living out the wisdom of C.S. Lewis in his book on the, or excuse me, in his essay on the reading of old books, where he talks about how every age has its blind spots, uh, and how uh, when we read outside of our age, we don't go to another age that has no blind spots, but the blind spots typically are different from ours, so we can spot ours, and it can also help us, uh, excuse me, spot theirs, but also help us be able to see our own. Uh, this is the kind of book, and this this was, it's pretty close to my standard. When I talk to you about how I want to encourage you, uh, to, I want to bring to your attention books that are not labors to read, my, my sort of uh, very practical standard for that is, if it's a book that I can read just before I go to sleep, then it's a book that should be pretty easy, pretty fun, pretty... Uh, just not burdensome. I don't like reading heavy books in general, and I especially don't like reading heavy books when I'm not working and when I'm getting ready to rest. This is one of those books. I encourage you to get it. I encourage you to read it. And as you might expect, I encourage you to let me know. I'm, I'm sure there's some of you out there who've read this book, and I tr hope some of you will read this book. Let me know what you think. Angels in the Architecture, published by Canon Press, written by Doug Jones and Doug Wilson. You know, there are uh, very few times when I feel real tension between wanting to use a word I know will be a little bit too difficult and being afraid to use that word. Because most of the time when there is a big word, a fancy word, a, a technological or theological jargon word, uh, that I fear some of you may not be familiar with. There's usually a very simple uh, substitute for us. For instance, if I if I use that, say something about, well, you need to have sound hermeneutics. Uh, some of you wouldn't know what that means, but it's not that complicated. It just means you need to have sound principles of biblical interpretation. You know what that means. No big deal. But there are some words where I'm like, I just don't know how to communicate this idea in a way that people who've not uh, devoted some time and energy to studying it will find it easy to understand. And one of those places is on the field, the subsection of philosophy that we, called, we call ontology. Ontology is the study of being. And one of the reasons that I am confident that many of you uh, don't find that easy to grasp is because I have never found it easy to grasp. If I did, then I'd probably be able to find an easy way to explain it. But I mention it today because we come now to another one of our segments on proper theology, and I want to speak to you today about the wisdom of God. And it struck me, as I was thinking through what should be said, that the first thing I want to do is make sure that you understand that wisdom, God's wisdom, is not the fruit of God's studying reality. Wisdom is not something that God acquired. It's not even something that God has. 
It is instead something that God is. God is wisdom. Wisdom's not below him, that he created it. Wisdom's not above him, that he learned it. It is him. It's what he is. Interesting, isn't it, that when uh, Job uh, can't take it anymore and finally uh, fails his test and goes to his loving father and says, in essence, uh, what gives, that God's response was to lay out his credentials. But his credentials were principally in that arena that we would call wisdom. Job, were you there when I established the pillars of the universe? Were you there when I laid out the skies like a scroll? This is so vital to our understanding of how the creation manifests the glory of God. It shows his wisdom. Again, we've said it before. I'm going to keep saying that doesn't mean God's a great engineer. But rather, engineering is what shows that God is great. That's why it's important for us to understand this principle of ontology because it keeps the first thing first. And the first thing is God himself. He is wisdom. Which means when we go to him and when we ask of him for wisdom, as James tells us, God gives to all liberally without finding fault. Well, why is that? It's because there's not a limited supply. He's not saying, hey, R.C., I'd love to give you a boatload of wisdom, but there are other people standing in line behind you. It's not like buying toilet paper at Costco, where God has to reserve some of the wisdom for other people. He has an infinite supply because he is the supply. God is wisdom. And so when we ask for wisdom, what are we asking for but him? You know, I've mentioned before how uh, the great Christian philosopher Gordon Clark uh, has argued that when John writes in his gospel, in the beginning was the word and the word was God, that word translated word is the word logos or logic. God is the ordering principle of the universe. It's because of who God is that two plus two is four. And neither Big Brother nor any other uh, uh, political organization can change that reality because God is God. So let's go to him for wisdom fearlessly, not only because it's what he is, but because sharing it is what he does. We come now to our final segment of our ongoing series, Meeting Jesus. And I wonder if there's anyone out there paying enough attention that they might have been wondering, well, what in the world is he going to do now? In fact, some of you may have thought after we covered the ascension of Jesus, surely that's got to be the end of the series. But we have instead, over the last two segments, looked at the Jesus encounter with Saul on the road to Damascus and his encounter with John on the island of Patmos. And now you must have been thinking, okay, now that's got to be the last one. Except it's not. This is the last one. So what did we wait for? for last. Well, we lay, waited for the last meeting with Jesus, the one we're all going to have. 
The reality is, friends, every single one of us will one day come face to face with Jesus. When he told his disciples that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth, this wasn't just a a poetic way of saying, hey, I've been installed as king. It includes that, but it also means that he's been installed as the judge of all things. Every single judgment you have made, every single judgment made regarding you, every single judgment that's ever happened apart from you, all judgments will one day find their appeal and their final appear, appeal when they come before the one true Supreme Court. Jesus always acts justly. Now, when we meet him, that may be, in fact, in some ways, it should be a scary thought. You know, I cringe every time I hear someone say, well, I may have done this or I may have done that, but God knows my heart. As if this should, should be a comforting thought, that God knows our hearts. He certainly does know our hearts, and that's not going to make things better. But better still, we are in Christ. And because of that, not because of our goodness, not because of our well-intentioned hearts, which don't exist, but because of his work for us, the one who laid down his life to receive the penalty due by justice for us instead of us is the one who will make the final judgment about us. I know that we've covered this already, but I love uh, the description, Luke's description in Acts about Stephen's vision as he's being martyred, being the first martyr of the New Testament church. And he tells us that he looks up to heaven and he sees the heavens open and he sees Jesus standing. Well, why in the world would Jesus be standing when he ascends to heaven? He ascends to a throne. He ascends to that judge's seat. Judges don't sit. Excuse me, judges don't stand. Judges do sit. But Jesus, who remains the judge, stands as Stephen's defense attorney. Jesus makes his argument, and Jesus' argument is Jesus, and Jesus' argument is to Jesus. And so when Jesus hears Jesus' argument of Jesus, Jesus then declares us not guilty. But you know, friends, I've spent many years trying to help us understand something else vitally important. The Bible uses language to help us understand the nature of the work of Christ for us, being our substitute. It uses language of substitution. It uses language of law-breaking and punishments. It uses language of debts and payment of debts. And so we end up talking about, well, my sins went to his account and his righteousness came to my account. And that's all true, all well and good. It's just not the whole story. Because in the final judgment, not only is Jesus our defense attorney, not only is Jesus the judge, but Jesus is the elder brother, not the bad elder brother from the parable of the prodigal son, but what the elder brother should have been. Because he is our elder brother, because he is the firstborn of many brethren, our father races to greet us, to throw his arms around us and not say to us, 
not guilty, but to say to us instead, my son, my son, my beloved son. Friends, we're going to meet Jesus. And if you are in him now, this will be a day of great joy immeasurable joy, the greatest joy imaginable. And if you're not, and if you're not in Christ when that day comes, it will be the worst day imaginable. One more reason that Jesus changes everything. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsprouljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.